and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. Today's guest in episode 24 is Benjamin Law. Since I first ventured into full-time freelance journalism in 2009, he's been someone that I've greatly admired, not only for his ability to write well across a range of publications and styles, but also for the simple fact that he's a generous and enthusiastic supporter of other writers. I first met him in early 2010 when I emailed him to introduce myself and ask for a meeting, and from that point he has remained a firm friend and mentor. I interviewed him for the Courier Mail that same year for an article that coincided with the release of his first book, The Family Law, a memoir which described his upbringing as a Chinese-Australian. The following year, he spoke about freelance journalism, alongside John Birmingham, at an event I hosted in Brisbane as part of National Young Writers Month. I reviewed his excellent second book, Geisha, for the Weekend Australian in 2012, and since then he has taken me suit shopping, offered me a place to crash while visiting Sydney, and provided some excellent and timely advice when I was negotiating my first book contract. As you've no doubt already gathered, I'm a big fan of Benjamin's. His career has recently taken an interesting turn into screenwriting, as his first book was turned into a six-part SBS television series. The Family Law debuted on Australian screens in early 2016. It was very well received, and Benjamin is currently writing the second season. His regular writing gig is his weekly column in Good Weekend, which never fails to make me laugh. When he visited Brisbane in late April for a QUT Journalism and Media Society event, where we were both speaking to university students about feature writing, I took the opportunity to interview Benjamin in an empty classroom before the crowds arrived. Our conversation touches on how a mentorship with Matthew Condon helped him to pitch stories and get his head around writing long-form features, how he was approached by a publisher to write The Family Law, what he learned about the book industry while working at Brisbane bookstore Avid Reader, how he comes up with ideas for his Good Weekend column, and how he views being in a relationship where both partners work in the creative industries. Introducing Benjamin Law, author, freelance journalist, columnist, and screenwriter. Benjamin Law, welcome. Hi, welcome. You are already recording already. Yes, we have begun. <laughs> Pleasure to see you. You're visiting Brisbane for, is it one night only for this? One night only. It's like a really bad John Farnham concert. The first and last time. <laughs> yeah, but I'll be back, of course. It's good to see you. I've known you for many six years. years, at least. Many, um, many years. I met you when I was a baby freelancer starting out. You were like a spermatozer with dreadlocks, <laughs> from my memory. That's uh, yeah, your memory is correct. <laughs> and from the beginning of meeting you, you've been a lovely and helpful and oh, thanks, influential Andrew. person in my life. Well, you've been very, very impressive right from the beginning. So th- I'll totally take your compliment. Thank you. Well, I mean that this show is all about people who work with words for a living, mm. and you have certainly done that for at better or for worse. Quite a high level for some time, and um, with the television show of recent time, it seems you're. Hitting peak Benjamin Law, you're exploding. As yeah, you never the have franchise has become multi-platform now, for better or for worse. What is it like at the moment? Because I've watched you, I've known you for some time, and your your ascent has been quite remarkable to watch. Does this feel like the peak to you? Um, so far, that is. No, it's it's funny. Someone was asking me the other day, like, what what is the ultimate for me? Because surely having a TV show must be where you're aiming for but the strange and slightly obscene thing for me has been that even with writing the book the family law I didn't I didn't plan that I was a publisher approaching me so I've been very very lucky in that way um the family law came about because the producer the executive producer of the show Tony Ayres approached approached me after reading it um which was really really fantastic because I was a huge fan of his for a really long time I guess there are a few morals of the story. One, I can't give very good career advice because I've kind of stumbled into these projects and I'm very willing to please. So I'll just say, yes, I'll, I'll do it. I don't know how to write a TV. Yes, I will write a TV show. Um, and I guess the other thing is I've been very, very lucky to have people who, who've got my back. Yeah. 
Tell me, I want to touch on your whole career if we can, because, uh -huh. I mean, all the way back to, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but can we start with Frankie? Because how did mm. that come about? I think that was your first significant publication that kind of put you on the map. Yeah, right? and like, look, prior to writing for Frankie, where was I at? I was um, doing production work for a street press. I was doing some interviews for that street press still, but probably my more doing stuff for the Korea Mail, so doing stuff in their arts pages and interviewing people like Cat Power, who's an amazing musician but really terrible to interview. Um, and then I was like, where, where do I go next? I was still studying at the time as well. Here at QUT? Here at QUT. And then I ran into a friend at a Bell and Sebastian concert. That is the most sort of twee thing I could say. <laughs> but I was at a Bell and Sebastian concert, wildly drunk, and my friend Sky was there. How are you doing? How are you doing? What are you up to? I, I'm working for a publishing company that's about to release a magazine called Frankie. Actually, you should talk to the editors. And at that stage, I couldn't drive. At that stage, Frankie was based on the Gold Coast and I was based in Brisbane. So I, I don't even know if the go-card was in existence then, but I caught the bus all the way to the Gold Coast, which takes a long time to exactly where I needed to go. And I met with the editors there. And you are right, it was probably the first publication where... I, it, it's a glossy magazine, it's a newsstand magazine, it's national as well, but they were also in their infancy, so it wasn't a huge magazine like it is now. Mm. You definitely couldn't get it at Coles, for instance, like you can now, but it was one of those incredible moments where I look back and I think the editors were so encouraging, Louise Bannister and Joe Walker, they were so encouraging of making sure that we built our voices in a magazine, they saw that as a real asset, whereas I think a lot of publications can sometimes say, we don't want your voice in it at all, please. We, we want you to mimic our voice. Yeah, exactly, mm. and some publications do that, you know, for better or for worse, and that's fine and legitimate, um, but Frankie was, was really fun, and it was really nice to grow with them as well. Did that feel like a big moment when they said, we want you, and you met with them at their office on the Gold Coast? Yeah, and it was, I think, one asset that I have uh, for all of my deficits is I can talk myself into situations. <laughs> okay, I can convince people to do things. Um, so Louise was so fantastic, and I think we clicked very, very quickly. Um, I showed her some of the work that I'd done for the Korea Mail. I showed her some work that I'd done for VoiceWorks, which is the magazine, the youth magazine, that comes out of Melbourne and Express Media. And she liked my ideas. She had an idea of what Frankie was, but when you're in your first issue, because I'd only just put their first issue to bed, you're still sorting out what is and isn't Frankie or whatever magazine you're creating. So mm. it was fun to be a part of that process in figuring out what the magazine was. Did that help you financially, that first gig? Because you were running for the Courier Mail, which presumably paid okay at the It time. paid fine. Yeah. Um, Frankie also paid fine. Um, yeah, it started becoming supplementary income. It wasn't anything I could live off, which probably explains why I was at university for eight years, because there were <laughs> welfare and scholarship opportunities <laughs> on offer. And, I mean, look, you would know as well, Andrew, like as a freelancer, your income is this ever-changing pie chart in terms of um, who you're writing for, what other weird random jobs come up. And Frankie was a part of that pie chart, sometimes ex expanded, sometimes contracted, but it was pretty modest. It only comes out every two months. Mm -hmm. Did you have any expectations around that role or where you saw yourself going with not only the Frankly, uh, the Frankie writing gig, but the other things you were doing? Was there a pathway that you saw for yourself? Not really. I, it's terrible to say, but and people who know me will back this up, but I really don't actually know what I'm doing a week ahead, actually. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Unless I have my iCal in front of me, I don't tend to think long-term very easily. It makes me a little anxious, to be honest. <laughs> And because I am not a stickler for sticking to a plan, um, I think it means that if strange opportunities come up, I can kind of weigh them up on their merits as they come. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you know, as a freelance, you want to line up as much work as possible. You want to be overcommitted rather than undercommitted. So I get that. But in terms of like long-term vision or trajectory, I, I honestly have no idea. So you kind of became a freelancer 
for a variety of publications rather than saying, I want to be a freelancer writing for these publications. You just kind of... Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think I like being professionally promiscuous. You know, I'm a slut, basically. Professionally promiscuous. Um, And also, I don't know. Like, I think I get bored easily. So it's not so much the prestige of the publications I'm looking for. Like, obviously... Um, I'm really lucky to write for Good Weekend nowadays and I worshipped that magazine from afar. Like, literally, growing up in Queensland, you could only get that at a few news agencies. <laughs> um, so I'm really stoked to be writing for them. But even then, it wasn't like, I need to write in Good Weekend. Opportunities presented themselves when they did. Definitely want to write for them. Um, or I'd pitch quite ferociously if I knew that was possible. Um and then, then I'd just work on the assignments, yeah. What year did you and Frankie cross paths? Oh, I don't know. A long time ago. So whoever knows Frankie's history, it was when issue two started. So it was in its first year, and that would have been oh, maybe even close to a decade ago mm. now, I imagine. Seven, eight years ago? Wouldn't surprise me. Did you feel up to the task? Did you feel that your voice and style as a writer was of a quality where you could be writing for... Yes, I knew from the moment I stepped into... No, I mean, um, look, some things were just fun. Like in the early days, you'd review all sorts of products, um, which they still do, but I remember reviewing meats or reviewing toilet paper. Like it was ridiculous and it wasn't... It wasn't about confidence, it was more about whether we could have fun with what we were writing. And I think I seek that in all of the work that I do, even if it is serious, long-form journalism. The fun comes from something fascinating revealing itself. Even if it's grim, even if it's dark, there is an element of fascination with, with what's being revealed. So it wasn't... Yeah, I didn't... God... Sounds really up myself. I guess I am. Yeah, I didn't. It wasn't really doubting myself because these were also people who became my friends very quickly. Right. Mm. Is there a danger with becoming friends with your editors? Um, maybe. No, I don't think so. Actually, because I think the opposite is worse when you see your editor as a guardian who's actively working against you. And to be honest, sometimes there are. I can see you smiling right now. You know you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you do encounter editors and you're like, I will fall for you, but I'll never write for you again. <laughs> um, but if they've been an editor for a while, there's probably a reason behind that. They're good. They know what a good story is. And a lot of them have been writers themselves. They know what it takes to write a good story. And I see editors as huge collaborators and and allies, and that can't not bleed into friendship sometimes. And I think, you know, on a basic level, it's about res- respect for what they do as well. And in my early years when I was, um, you know, first, second, third year of university, I do a lot of work experience for magazines, and it paid to acknowledge how hard editors' jobs are as well. So... Look, I am not going to say no to drinking with my editors. Mm-hmm. They're actually some of the most fun people. I'm not surprised to hear that you're friends with at least some of your editors because uh, yep. you may know this, you may not, but uh, <laughs> you, you're renowned among the Australian media as being... A slut. ...one of the most charming people oh, in the business. okay. Like, I, 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 well, if that's a part of my brand, I will accept that. I wasn't aware. <laughs> I've met many people who start speaking about you and just can't stop talking about how much of a nice guy you are. Oh, that's very nice, I'm wondering Andrew. whether... My question is, is that a strategy on your part? Are you actually a dark asshole? I at hate the heart? everyone. I hate <laughs> everyone. I've paid Andrew to say all those nice things, by the way. Um, I, I have been told on several occasions um, by people who are close to me that I'm a bit too nice to people, that I give people the benefit of the doubt too much. Um... And maybe that's true because, I mean, I've had, I've had numerous drunken conversations with friends where they're like, Ben, just admit it, X or Y, whatever person we're talking about at the time, is a word that's, uh, that I can't broadcast you on can podcast. Say what you want. Oh, really? They will just say, Ben, they're a cunt. Just say they're a cunt. And I'm like, yeah, but they might have had a really tough childhood. Or, or, I mean, oh, they're obvious. Day. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is true, you know, like I think people's, why people behave the way they do is more fascinating than anything. But I, I, I like 
people, I think. Um, I think to be a writer, or at least a writer who writes about people, um, there is a part of you that... It's not love, because that's a, that's a bit Oprah, but it is this deep interest and empathy. And to, to convey empathy towards people, often people that you've only just met, I think is an exercise in, you know, reaching out, putting yourself in people's shoes. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's where my silky charm comes from, Andrew. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think that can be learned or does it have to be inherent in a person to have that empathy and that desire to want to connect? Um, look, I think some people are born innately with it. It's funny, like I'm 33 at the moment, so a lot of my friends are like, popping out children i am surrounded by babies and and toddlers and four and five and six year olds at the moment and some of the kids are inherently more (laughs) curious and i can see myself in some of these terrors because they ask endless questions (laughs) they are so curious about your life um you know to the point of completely violating your privacy all that sort of stuff that I probably would have been conveying as a child as well. (laughs) I think there are people who, you know, if if you're born a busybody, I remember reading this interview with Lee Sales, for instance, like, or actually she wrote an essay about, about how much of a busybody she was as a child and how much it would get her in trouble with um, her father, who is an ex-military frightening dude, you know? (laughs) And I think there are some people who are innately like that, and anyone listening to this, I mean, you'd know Andrew as well. Like, there are sometimes conversations that you land in with people and they do not ask you a single question about yourself. Not saying that we're the most interesting people in the room necessarily, but that's not a conversation. Mm. Sure. Tell me about some of those random weird jobs that have cropped up throughout your freelance career. Oh. I mean, the toilet paper review for Frankie is pretty weird. Do you have um, things like copywriting or um, ghostwriting type jobs where your byline isn't attached to them that have come up? Oh, uh, look, um, the random stuff that's come up has been fine. It hasn't been too demoralising. I mean, I, I remember writing advertorial for Nike at one stage. Well, um, and I really had to think about, you know, what is Nike? Are they still involved in slave labour, essentially? And... I did enough research to see that they'd turned a corner with their practices enough to justify being able to be paid by Nike, even though no one can probably ever be justified in that position whatsoever. Um, I have I've taught a lot, like a lot. That was my main source of income for writing, a while. Right. Teaching writing at university for state writer centres and stuff like that. That's right. I, I picked up one of your master classes at the Queensland Writer Centre when you suddenly couldn't make it. Yeah, you yeah, asked if yeah. I could do it. Because I'm just I, like, I, mean, I know someone else who can do this just as well, if not better. So That's a lie. But um, <laughs> you sent me your PowerPoint very kindly. Like oh. You kind of gave me all your notes and I rambled on for Happy to share. five hours or something. Happy shit. to share. You also appeared in some kind of... Uh, television commercial or oh yeah i was the face of uniqlo for like five minutes and again <laughs> i was like who are these people why are they selling their shirts so cheaply i mean I, I i like uniqlo they're not just paying me to say that by the way but you know when i'd go to japan i'd buy their shirts because they actually fit my sweetly proportioned asian body <laughs> um but yeah it was one of those things where i'm like do i sell my soul for this have they signed the bangladeshi accord that very basic level of things so that were one of the last major companies to do so but at least they did and then i said yes i will accept your money uniqlo if you want some dero rider i'm sure not that many people know about to be in your ad campaign sure well, we'll see about that. There's a crowd forming at the door of the, the bang hordes who want to hear what Ben Law has to say it's about future writing. actually a lie. They're not, there's no one outside whatsoever. <laughs> um, but, you know, in terms of other weird stuff, there was this phase at Good Weekend uh, when it was being edited by Ben Napastek where just all these stories involving nudity came up. So I think there was a nude yoga story that he asked me to do. And I had to pose naked for the photos. Classic but, photo shoot. Please, yeah. please Google that. I'll have the link in the show notes, everyone. Yeah, it's if great. you Google Benjamin Law naked, one of the photos does come up. But some really 
other photos you might not want to see come up in, as well. They, they're not of me, but they are interesting. Um, yeah, and then I d- did like a naked art gallery tour of the National Gallery in Canberra as well. So there's been a lot of nudity in my work. There's like a nudity trilogy in my feature writing. Yeah, there was one for Q Weekend. There was one for Q Weekend about too. Uh, a nude beach on the Sunshine Coast. Well, then the, the interesting thing about that story is you know, in Queensland, where we currently are, um, it's the only mainland Australian state with no nude beaches. And I've always found that Queensland's been quite strange, that it is anomalous in very particular ways in its legislation that are complete overhangs from the Bjorki Peterson era. And that's one of them. The other one, another one is like American Psycho is still supposed to legally be sold in shrink wrap. Another one is that we're the only Australian state with a discrepancy between age of consent for straight and gay people. Like, it's bizarre. Mm. So, yes, there's a serious side to just getting my ass out, Andrew. It mm. takes a certain kind of confidence to write a 4,000 word feature story about get a nude beach where sure. you're willing to be nude and to take notes and take your dictaphone along to the beach yeah but that's just the hook my my penis is the hook um and <laughs> but the then the, on hook shape. yeah, yeah it's not weird. it's not some, i don't have peyronie's disease or anything like that <laughs> but but the thing is i knew that story could be four thousand words because there are all these other big serious questions behind it like why is a man why is an elderly gentleman arrested for being naked on a beach where he's harming no one and no one is actually offended by it but police officers like it seemed very very strange um why is there why is there this strange event in noosa that is technically illegal but there are tits and asses out all around what what is the appeal of nudity and what is public attitudes uh, towards nudity been like in australia like, there are all these big questions and I think, like, my favourite long-form articles, my favourite writing, has that mix. It's, like, ridiculous and very serious. That article appeared in QE Ken yes. when Matt Connan was editor? Yes, that that's right. Matt, Matt let me get away with a lot. Yeah, I mean, tell me about how the role that he's played in your career, because he, you and he had some kind of mentorship at some stage. Yeah, so after I finished my... I think it was my doctorate i've studied a lot but i forget when it was i'm pretty sure it was after my phd um i realized i was about to go out in the world as a freelancer trying to make it uh freelancing full time which is a pretty insane thing to do andrew's smiling at me at the moment in recognition (laughs) um and the funny thing is i've been freelancing since i was 17 in some way shape or form on the side or blah 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 as a hobby And now I was in my mid-twenties, I really needed someone by my side to tell me how I did this thing. By that stage I was working for Frankie, but as I said, it's it's a modest form of income because it only comes out every two months. Um, And I was ready to write meaty stuff. I really liked the journalism that was coming out with with Q Weekend. I remember when Q Weekend launched, it was a really big deal to have a glossy magazine in a metropolitan newspaper dedicated to journalism like lengthy journalism and i wanted to write for them i felt like maybe i could by that stage ah, so you had some confidence you're like i, I could be in there you could yeah but yourself. it's a but it's a slow build you know like yeah. john birmingham tells the story of how he just decided one year like he was gonna be a writer and i think he was like living off rice and probably malnutrition by the end of that year but because he forced himself into that position uh, he was a writer by the end of that year because he had no choice. I'm, I'm, I don't have reserves of chutzpah like, like JB because mine was very gradual. Like I was at university for seven to eight years before I thought maybe I can do this full time. But I approached Matt and the good thing about the mentorship program that we did was the mentor gets money as well. So at least I could say to him, look, you don't know me. I really like your work. You don't know me. But if you say yes, I might get some money for you. And the great thing is, Matt is a fantastic person. I don't know that because, well, I know that now, but we also had a lot of mutual friends at the time. And he really took me under his wing and introduced me um, to Christine Midap, who was the then editor, now the editor for Weekend Australian magazine. She's like such a gun. And Matt just basically forced me to pitch story ideas to her and she, she took them. 
Uh-huh. Yeah. Tell me more about pitching, because um, <laughs> I have, this is, you'll be episode 24, I believe, and there's been a, a couple of freelancers like yep. John Birmingham, but um, describe pitching to people who may not be familiar with freelance journalism and how that works. Pitching is an exercise in approaching a stranger and telling them that you should work for them and that they should give you money. That's what it is. And I think a lot of people don't have enough respect for the fact that an editor doesn't know who you are and you're selling yourself in saying, I can write the story. So a pitch is this kind of tightrope act improving in a very economical economical um, space in an email that, you, that you've got a great idea and that you're the person to write it. Um, and I don't know, like... It's not like I was taught pitching at university. It's been a huge trial and error process for me. Did Matt Condon help with that? Matt Condon helped a lot because Mm. Q Weekend was the first publication where I was writing stories over 4,000 words and I would tell him like a hunch that I had for what I think would work for Q Weekend and he's like, yeah, but how about like if you did that and that and that, just tweaked it a little. I'm like, that's genius. So he was that really great sounding board. Um... And I guess the other thing is with freelancing, you just pitch a lot because most of your pitches get rejected. Um, some editors you build a relationship with and they know you're up for the task and they'll probably accept 100% of your stuff if, if the story is good enough. But at least when it's a new editor or when you're starting out, um, prepared for a lot of rejection. Our work is kind of like acting in a way. Yeah. You know, a lot of auditions and not many callbacks. Did you deal well with rejection when you were first uh, entering the freelance market, I suppose? Um, did I deal well with rejection? You know what? Like VoiceWorks, a magazine that I mentioned before, um, which anyone under the age of 30 should be contributing to because it's it's... You know, its patron is John Marsden. He publishes writers from all over Australia who are who are young, some teenagers as well. I remember pitching to them, and their rejections would be beautiful because they would not only contact you back, which a lot of editors don't, but they would tell you if your story was getting through, what, what they loved about it, and if your story wasn't getting through, what they still liked about it, but why it wasn't going to make the grade. And that taught me a lot. And it taught me that a, re- a, a rejection isn't saying to you that you are a piece of shit, even though you feel like a piece of shit. Um, yeah. It's just saying that it's not necessarily right for the magazine. Um, and I think the way that I've dealt with rejection is, I, you know, especially when I was mainly writing for magazines, my pitching volume was so huge um, that I didn't actually care if I got rejections because I'd have enough work because I pitched so much that the work that came back was enough to sustain myself. Where did you get your ideas from? Like, we're kind of talking retrospectively here because mm. you're, you're not doing so much features at the moment. No, you're no. doing the column with Good Weekend and various other things which we'll come to. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, where did you get your ideas from during those few years of your, your peak feature writing, I suppose? Uh, a lot of places, drunken conversations, like... <sighs> You know, I never wrote this story, but, you know, like, for instance, oh, you're tattooed, you're pregnant, I'm gay, none of us can give blood, what's up with that? You know, when there is a what's up with that kind of drunken conversation or a conversation over dinner, Mm. um, that's always a good idea, so I always file that away. And the thing about ideas, and you probably do this as well, Andrew, is you, you have to write them down quickly, otherwise you do forget. My memory's like a sieve. I forget ideas very easily. Mm. So I built like a whole, um, you know, whether it was in an app or sometimes I'd use like sticky notes or something like that. Um, I would have this stockpile of ideas. Uh, Other times it was listening to a news story and thinking, wow, that's really interesting, but like what must that person's life be like? So it was a normal news story, but with not much human dimensions. And Mm. as a as a you know writer who's more interested in longer stories i'd always be curious about what's that person's life like um and if no one's written a feature about it i'll write the feature it's not just a new story it's something 
more in depth. So, you know, reading the news, um, listening to the radio a lot. My, my boyfriend works in radio as well, so the radio's on a lot. Um, what else? Book clubs, which is really weird. Like, I was, I've been a member in and out of book clubs for a really long time, but you read stuff you wouldn't usually read and you have conversations with people you wouldn't usually meet as well. So there was one piece for Q Weekend that I wrote, which is about abstinence education that takes place throughout Queensland still. And sex education and the way it's applied in Queensland schools, whether it's state or independent, is so ad hoc, weird, and often anachronistic. And people will go around to school saying that you should be abstinent and that is the only way to not get any sexually transmitted infections. And I thought, wait, like well, it's... Say the point. Well, that, I mean, that is the best way. But, you know, <laughs> there are other ways as well, Andrew, like yeah. mutual masturbation and there are, there are ways to use contraceptives as well. But they would say things like condoms aren't going to protect you and don't have a good success rate, which is bullshit because condoms used correctly have way over 90% success rate at preventing pregnancy and disease. So I was like, what's that about? And that idea came from a book club where we were reading a book called Female Chauvinist Pigs by the New Yorker writer Aria Levy. And that was a lot about sex education. All the book clubbers were Queenslanders. And I was like, wait, that is so weird. Why is everyone's sex education experience is so remarkably different? And when you've got a question that can't be answered easily, that's a feature story as well. So those are some sources, Drunken Conversations, News, and weirdly, Book Club. <laughs> when did you and Avid Reader cross paths? Because Fiona Steger is a previous guest of Penmanship as well. Oh, and yeah. Obviously, you're one of the... Uh, She's one of my heroes, favored, very good friend. Favoured former employees. Um, yeah, when did that, how did that happen? Avid Reader is so great. I mean, for those of you who are listening in Brisbane, you would know that it's this hub of excellence and loveliness my favorite bookstore in the country um but it's really funny because i was a i was living in west end at the time i think i owned a fire twirling stick and uh and i would go to avid a lot to browse most of the time because i didn't have that much money to buy new books at that stage um but you know it's it's a it's a joyous thing to just walk into a bookshop and hang out and I made friends with the staff, made friends with Fiona as well. I was just that weirdo, regular <laughs> customer dude. Ben, that Asian with acne and braces, as I probably did have at the time. <laughs> and then I think I entered the a Young Writers Award. Um, I'm not sure if it still exists, but you wrote short stories and then the Korea Mao with government funding would pick the best ones and... And I didn't win, but I, I came runner-up one year for a short story that I wrote. And I think the day after that came out, I got a, I got a message on my answering machine. That's how I remember answering machines. So we had an answering machine at my place. And it was Fiona Steger saying, Hey, Ben, um, congratulations on your thing. Just wondering, would you be interested in working for us? And so it's a really strange thing because you think that with a retail job, you go in, you hand in your resume and you slog it out because you're not particularly passionate about it. But working for Avid Reader is one of those things where people are there because they're writers or they're completely passionate about books and writing and literature. And I ended up working at Avid Reader for half a decade and some of the happiest moments in my life, actually, it was, it was in itself a fantastic education to be surrounded by so many books and to buy them at a significant discount because you were on staff. <laughs> yeah. What did you learn about the book business working at a bookstore? Did you kind of get a peek behind the curtain of what actually went on? Yeah. Knowing how books are distributed, the difference between distributors and publishers. I mean, at this stage, I genuinely didn't have any interest in writing a book. My whole idea was probably gleaned from Almost Famous. You know, just I'm going to be... Uh, a music journalist to begin with or just a features journalist and I'm going to travel the world and write for magazines and I was kind of doing that and I was happy to work at a bookshop so that seemed pretty sweet um, but yeah in retrospect it was this kind of education in, into the book world that I wasn't anticipating how books are sold how important independent booksellers are in Australia the fact that indie booksellers in this country are still going strong is something to really celebrate and also protect as well. Um, Avid Reader, like a lot of independent bookshops like Berkelau in Sydney and Glee Books in Sydney and Readings in Melbourne, is a hub also for events. You know, they make sure that there's a constant literary festival going on 
throughout their year and that people are sharing ideas because bookshops aren't just about the artifact of books. It is an ideas exchange. And the people who came in were uh, smart and strange and hilarious. Uh, the customers taught me a lot as well. Anna Bly was a regular. Mm-hmm. Um, it, was, it was a really fantastic education into, I don't know, how, how important those spaces are as well and what work goes into making sure they thrive. Did the family law, getting the contract for that book, did that overlap with uh, working at Avid Reader? I think it might have. I think it launched and I was working there. So I'm, I remember helping stack chairs and stuff like that. And for the launch? Yeah, All yeah. Right. Well, um, how did that first book come about? What was the process there? Um, so I was writing a lot for Frankie mm-hmm. and I think even Q Weekend by that stage, so doing journalism for Q Weekend. And then there was a call out for an anthology called Growing Up Asian in Australia. And I was like, hey, I, I grew up Asian in Australia. <laughs> and it was, it was actually really great because the essays that they wanted or the short stories that they wanted could be several thousand words long. And I'd always thought with some of the pieces that I'd written for Frankie that touched on my family, um, you know, the maximum word count for Frankie was maybe 1,200 words for a longer piece, but mainly 650, which is pretty short. And I always knew there was more to a lot of the stories that I'd already written for them. So I thought this is a good opportunity to expand those stories, look at what happened during my parents' divorce, look at what happened, you know, when I was trying to, like, bulk up and be a dude, all that sort of stuff. So I submitted two essays for that anthology that was edited by... Alice Pung, who's one of the best Australian writers of her generation, and um, didn't hear back from for a while, and I thought, oh, well, this is demoralising. I went into this anthology smugly because I grew up Asian in Australia, yeah. and now I'm not going to be in this anthology. How, how depressing. Um, but it all turned out well in the end because what happened was the two essays that they chose for the book both got into the anthology, so I was super stoked about that. And beyond that, Chris Fike, who is known in Melbourne as the George Clooney of publishing, he's a very handsome, erudite, excellent human being. Um, He contacted me out of the blues, introduced himself. I don't know if you know what I do, but I'm the publisher at Black Ink Books. And of course I knew what Black Ink Books were because I'd been working in a bookshop for that long. They're they're one of the greatest small-scale publishers in this country and they're part of the broader Schwartz empire that encompasses the monthly and quarterly essay um, and all that stuff. And Chris asked me, do you have a book up your sleeve or are you working on a book at the moment? He asked you that directly. Yeah, and my genuine answer was, like, no, like, no. No. I hadn't thought of that whatsoever. But but I wasn't going to say no because if someone says to you, do you want to write a book? I mean, I haven't thought about it. Maybe I can. What would that look like? And someone I'd been reading for for a long time by that stage was David Sedaris. And I thought, well, David Sedaris essentially hasn't ever written a book-length work. It's always been a collection of his essays that run around 4,000 words, maybe. And I'd just written two essays at the 4,000-word mark, and I thought, maybe if I wrote more of those essays, smooshed them into book form like David Sedaris does, could I get away with that? And so I pitched that to Chris. He said yes, and... That's how the family law came about. Great story. Um, <laughs> tell tell listeners about David Sedaris if they've not heard of you. I'm sure many okay, will so have, but he's David's, a big influence in your work. Yeah, your work. absolutely. I mean, I worship at his feet and you know, other writers who sort of write in this sort of style, whether it's, say, Marie Cardi here or Lena Dunham in the States, everyone will say that they love David Sedaris because David Sedaris, um, for those of you who don't know, I think he'd be in his late 50s now, maybe early 60s, but I think late 50s, and he is an American gay writer who, like me, was brought up in a really big family of a lot of siblings and with a slight immigrant experience as well. Um, One of his parents is Greek, and I totally related to all of his essays, and he was discovered because he, I think he was doing readings out of his diary at a... um, at some sort of salon event and Ira Glass, the host of This American Life, was at that and thought David was so, so funny. Mm -hmm. And then he sort of became a radio star which then led to him becoming a a star in print as well. And he's just vicious and acerbic and droll, really witty 
and really heartfelt as well. You know, he can write about coming out as gay with this comic tenderness that completely breaks your heart. Mm. And for me, reading his stuff, I think I discovered him in my early 20s, reading his stuff was a revelation because he combines tragedy and comedy so well and reminds you that they are not opposites. They're often very closely linked, which is how I tend to see the world as well. And so, um, yeah, the fact that I read him gave me confidence that, well... Other people can write in short form. I'm not sure if I can write as well as David Sedaris, but at least I've got an idea of what other people have done with, with that kind of word length. Did you find The Family Law an easy book to write? Oh, look, I've probably blocked out most of the writing process. Um, <laughs> that, that, tends to, that tends to happen with me because, I mean, you know, you'd know this too, Andrew. Anyone who's listening who is a writer would know this. Writing's fucked. I mean, it's so hard and every sentence is a failure until it's not. You know, you're constantly editing. That doesn't work. Okay, what does work? I'll try this. That's not quite right either. You go to the thesaurus. Actually, all these words are shit. It's this constant, constant process of wanting to kill yourself. Um, And so in that basic line-by-line way, I'm sure it wasn't easy to write. What was joyous about writing it was doing things like interviewing my family because I think we all take for granted our family stories, but when you try to write a memoir or a memoir-ish kind of book, when you start to write stories, you realise how many gaps there are in your knowledge and you, I decided, well, if there are all these gaps in my knowledge, I'm going to treat this like research and part of research is talking to my folks like an interview and they were super responsive to it it's really strange i think my dad had a new respect for me seeing me look like a journalist or something like that and he was really open because he's not a man of a lot of words but when he saw me in work mode he really opened up which was really nice it should be a trick that i use in future actually when i want to have a more in-depth conversation (laughs) with him so you had your notebook and pen and yeah yeah yeah. i treated it like like work um and the other thing that wasn't I mean, your question was about whether it was easy or hard. I'm not really sure, but one of the things I found really um, satisfying about it was was that, was doing research. Like, for instance, in 1986, a lot of my extended family was deported out of the country. I was four years old at the time, didn't really know the full story of what had happened. And so I had to go to the State Library archives and find out what happened in the microfilm record. And again, it was like work. And I liked that aspect of it because I feel like when I'm writing feature articles, journalism, I know what I need to do. Even if it's not easy, I know what I need to do. And there were aspects of the book that were easier because I treated it in the same way. Hmm. Was Chris your editor on that book? Yeah. Oh, my God. He's such a good editor. What what was the gap between your first draft and the the final product? Oh, God. It's like... (sighs) It never ends. I mean, anyone who's done like a postgrad degree will know what I'm talking about, where it's like, I'm done. I finished my thesis first draft. I, I am done. I've submitted it. Oh, wait, examiner's report. Oh, now I need to make all these edits. I think I'm done is the grad ceremony. Like there's all these stages where a book's never quite complete in a very similar way. Um, but look, I, I imagine the editing process probably took like six months or something like that. I can't remember. But... I was very, very grateful. I mean, you've got line editors as well who go through it line by line, grammar by grammar, but Chris sort of is that editor who gives it shape and asks the big questions about what I'm trying to say with that essay or are we sure this is where we want to go? Is this the right tone for this kind of story? All that sort of stuff. He was that kind of guy and then um, had another editor who was the line editor. But Chris was fantastic and what's funny is... Uh, now that a lot of my friends have written incredible books and novels and blah, 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 I do know that getting a great editor isn't a standard experience. <laughs> so I'm really grateful. If Chris Fike ever says, I want to be your editor, you say yes. You say yes, listener, Chris Fike. Are you glad that was your first book? Um, Do you think you, you picked well that, that pitch of the It's so funny. When you story. ask that question, it just sounds like you're asking about virginity loss. It's just like, <laughs> did you pick well for your first time? <laughs> yeah. You can answer both questions if you want. Yeah, and I think there's a kind of uh, stupid bravado that comes with your first book 
there's a stupid bravado that comes with being in your 20s as well because uh, you know you, uh, several years later when I would re- record the audio book for the family law I would cringe because you know to read your own old work is like wanting to stab yourself in the dick um, you know it's, all, it's excruciating and you always think fuck I would not write that way I would not write that way now I would not write, I'd definitely not write about that mm. um, and part of that is sort of getting your guard up as you get older as well but there is this kind of like at least for me this impulse to just say everything at a really young age and I can see that in that book I mean I'm 30, 33 now I wrote that book in my mid 20s um you would have been 27 when it came out yeah 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 so i probably would have started writing when i was 25 and um yeah it was it is this thing like i think it was a really good book to write as my first book because it's pretty honest um in a way i'm not sure i would want to write anymore um and it was great because as rough and ragged as that book is, I think I needed to get my family story almost kind of out of the way because my family story is a really complicated one and I feel like I needed to tell that before I could tell any other big story about my life. And of course, <laughs> the irony is now I'm telling it again on another on another platform. But um, I think it resonated with a lot of people and that was the most gratifying thing. Did you notice any immediate or maybe within the first six or 12 months after its release did you notice that your career changed anyway or the way that editors interacted with you did things get easier noticeably um i'm not sure i guess the the main difference was suddenly i'm an author and being an author means that you can talk at writers festivals or events where authors are you know um because you've you've done your book and you've got your second one um there is something that does change a little, mm. maybe if it's imperceptible at first, but, you know, there are writers and writers who write for a living and then there are people who are considered authors because they've written a book and it has a spine and all that sort of stuff. So mm. I, I think the, the main... Look, the main thing that probably changed wasn't my interaction with editors because I just want to get the job done or whatever. Um, it was more <laughs> my bio changed and... Mm. I could talk about a book at events. Kind of like a status change. You weren't just yeah. one of the thousands of freelance journalists. You are now an author and a freelance journalist. Yeah. But with that, because mm. that, that is a great thing, um, but there is a kind mm. of mild horror to it as well because you can never take that book off the shelf. Like The thing is with, with writing feature articles, magazines, those magazines will go away soon enough. You know what I mean? And I am one of those people who tends to self-flagellate about what I could have done to make that story better. Um, Or I see it differently. Or a month later, I'll have a revelation. Like, oh, that's what the story... Fuck, why did it take me a month to realise that was what the story was about? Mm. Because I'm a fucking idiot. Um, But with books, there is this sense of permanence there. And, yeah, it's... uh, there is a pride in writing a book and there is this mild existential horror about it as well. And yet you got back on that, that horse relatively quickly with uh, Gazia, your next yeah, book. Yeah, um, yeah. What was the gap between publication of the family law and either pitching that idea or maybe Chris or someone else asking you again if you had any ideas? What was the, the gap? No, I was ready to go because uh, I'd, I'd finished the family law, at least the first draft, and I've got this really bad habit where I am just wanting to burst out, like in the final stages of a project or a big project, like when I was doing my doctorate, I was just like, I cannot wait to do the next thing. I think I already know what I want to do. Oh, I'm going to write a pitch about it, blah, 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 blah. Because, you know, it's like writing is like prison. Um, and so at the end of the family law, look, when you write about yourself and your family, it's kind of gross by the end of it actually you've been so self-reflective you've been stewing in your own anxiety and your own memories for a long time you haven't really met anyone like you do with with journalism um and i think the extroverted side of me was trying to burst out of that introvert bubble and get out into the world again i hadn't hadn't traveled in a long time either um and so I had the, the, the idea for Geisha came pretty quickly, actually, because, I mean, there are a few things. I mean, 
being gay and Asian myself, you do ask yourself the question of what if? What if I'd been born in China where my dad was born, Malaysia where my mum was born? Mm. As a gay person, what would that look like? I was really interested in a lot of news stories, like queer news stories that were set in Asia at that time as well. Again, what is the human dimension to those stories I wanted to find out and yeah like I said I just wanted to freaking travel I was busting to get out there so I pitched the book um, yeah just as drafts were going out for family law hmm. to Chris again and to Chris can... to Chris who was a little bit overwhelmed I think but looking back my pitch was not even in written form I was on the phone I was like so Chris I'm going to write this book about gays in Asia and I'm going to go to every Asian country there's a lot of countries in Asia I'm going to go to every Asian country and document what it's like to be gay in Asia and I think I can I forget if Chris said it this exactly or, but I remember hearing it in his voice but it's like one Asia's a very big place and two the other thing is could I narrow it down more because you know can you imagine someone trying to write a book like what is it like to be a white man in Australia. Like, I mean, come on, that experience is so diverse. So I, I needed to change the angle. So yes, it was about queer lives in Asia, but it took me a while to figure out that I would be writing about issues rather than trying to encyclopedically mm. go through the country and document everything, because that's not a story. Did the structure come easily to you, or was that another process where you worked closely with Chris on how the, the final manuscript mm, sat? Because I, I reviewed Gage for The Australian. I know, thank I, you. I read, that was a very good review. I thank really you, liked Andrew. It, great thank you. Um, again, the cheat is the book has no structure. It's seven different, really long, long pieces. Like, I guess if they're published in a magazine, it would be the big eight thousand word feature about a place eight ten thousand words maybe per per chapter um but the angle was look like i could have written about transgender and transsexual rights in china in india none of these topics were exclusive to that country but i would always locate them in a cultural space where i thought that was really peculiar or that really challenges my baggage and prejudices about the story as well um, or it's a really interesting social phenomenon in that in that in that country so for instance um, with uh, transgender transsexual rights I just wanted to go to the obvious place which is Thailand because I think trans women are the butt of jokes over in Thailand but also at the same time they are Heralded and celebrated in mainstream cultural events as well. And I thought, wow, maybe this is the promised land for trans women. Obviously not, because I'm coming in as an outsider with those prejudices and pre- and misconceptions. Mm. Um, so I thought, let's, uh, let's topple some of them over, at least to the best of my abilities. We're talking, I don't know, four or five years ago for that, that writing process. Do, do you recall if you were taking notes... Like copious amounts of notes oh while, you were, while you're out in the field, or did you kind of wait yeah. until you got back? No, no, I um, I was very aware and very anxious that you know when you interview someone or you're on the ground for a story, and even if you leave it a week, you've lost so much detail. And so I was really anxious about you know I knew I knew this was a book again. You know it was going to be recorded all permanently and sit on a shelf. So I was really anxious about making sure I was getting as much detail as possible, getting quotes. I mean, I was recording on dictaphones and transcribing in hostels with no windows and on trains in India, and it was kind of nuts, actually. And But the, but the other thing is, it's weird. Like, I knew I was coming into my late 20s, and I kind of thought, Ben, by the time you're 30, you're not going to have the energy to do stuff like this. And I know 30's not old at all, but you probably won't even be able to tolerate how much gross shit you're putting yourself through <laughs> at the moment. So just go for it. If you've got the energy, um, really, you know, you don't need to sleep that much. Stay awake, do those transcripts, figure out, block the story while you're on the ground as well. Don't wait till you get back to Australia. But then coming back to Australia was helpful because it gave me some perspective as well. But I needed all that detail right there and then. So I was writing as I was researching. Hmm. What do you like during the writing process? Say you have a deadline, whether for a book or a, a screenplay, a script or mm. a feature. What do you like to be around in that moment, in those uh, days? Probably not the best company. 
I try to be look my, my writing space is really quiet because I do find that I need complete silence to really concentrate on what I'm writing about I used to be able to write with music like as a teenager but no longer so it's monk like silence I um I'm really focused on the task because I am anxious about deadlines. I am a disgusting people pleaser. Um, so I also get distracted very easily by the internet. So I activate freedom and I give myself three hours or whatever just to do writing and freedom being an app which dis- disables the internet that's right so i actually need you know it's pretty pathetic but i need to actively disable the internet um otherwise i can't concentrate on my work because even if i go on the internet for one minute i'm not in the zone anymore and i know that sounds really wanky but it is a, it is a zone sure. that, that you get into with writing um yeah so i write i write i write i try to break the say i've got a month to write a big feature article like a 4,000 5,000 word beast I break that month up so the first the first day is doing nothing but getting contacts of people and what I want from them I'm not even contacting them yet but I'm just doing all that groundwork and then day two might be the blitz where I'm calling and emailing and just generally being really fucking annoying (laughs) and then I give myself to the end of that week to lock down all of their schedules and times where I can hopefully interview them in week two. Like, I really do mm. break it down into what I want it achieved by those weeks, by the end of that day, by the end of that hour, all that sort of stuff. And then I give myself as much space as possible to to write it because I think that's the most difficult, delicate part of the process. Do you edit as you go, or do you kind of just vomit it all out on the page and then go back and take it uh, aside? Yeah, no, I'm constantly editing mm. as I go. Um, yeah, no, and I don't start from the start. I start from where I think there's a good morsel of a story, um, or I want to write a scene like that I'm really excited about writing. Structure, I think, for me, I play around with it a bit. So, you know, say there's a life or death scenario, I'm like, oh, that really feels like the hook. I'll put it there for now. And I... I Do you use Scrivener, Andrew? Oh, yes. Yeah, so I use Scrivener as well. And the great thing, writers listening to the podcast, which I assume you all are, um, the good thing about that is you're kind of writing in discrete chunks. And then Scrivener allows you to change the order of those chunks and see what that looks like as a whole document mm-hmm. again. So I, I tend to do that. I write in little discrete bits. And I'm like, that's good drama. That's good exposition. But I usually have a kind of a vague formula. for Not a formula, but I know where the scaffolding should be. The start is definitely the hook that will grab your interest and hopefully keep you there. Maybe there's suspense that will keep you there. An unanswered question mm. that I won't answer till the conclusion. Then the second bit is the nut graph, and that's where <laughs> I explain all the boring shit um, that you need to know in order to understand the, the story. Yeah, so I kind of do that, yeah. When you press submit on a piece of writing of any sort, how confident are you that it's good? Oh, I don't care by that stage. <laughs> like, I, I'm just like, I actually don't know whether it's good or not. Yeah. I don't know whether it's shit. I don't know whether it's good. All I do know is that it's done. And all I do know is that it will have edits either way. So it doesn't actually matter whether it's good good or bad because either version will need work it's just a spectrum of how much work it needs and the editor will tell you as such Mm -hmm. yeah i just yeah i leave the desk i go for a swim or i get a beer (laughs) are you ever afflicted by what's known as writer's block oh fuck yeah but it's not it's not like block like i don't know what to do next like i think that is very much for like fiction writers i imagine and, you know, writing screenplays like I am at the moment is kind of like writing fiction because it's like, fuck, what does the character want to say? What are they trying to get across? How does that work in real-life dialogue? But with nonfiction, it's... Um, I don't know. It's more for me getting stuck about not what comes next, but what is what is the meaning of all of this? Like, you know, writing is about analysing and critiquing mm-hmm. and... It's not just saying this is what happened and that's the story. Like Ira Glass, who I brought up before, the host of This American Life, he says that every story is essentially action, 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 reflective thought. You know, you have to have processed the story. As a writer, 
you know what happened. So there's a big car accident, lion escaped, lion eats a child, whatever. But what does it mean? You know, what is... What does it mean for the reader? What does it mean in a public policy sense, maybe? Mm -hmm. What does it mean about childhood? Like, what are you getting at? And that's, I think, is the biggest challenge for nonfiction writing, finding out what the story actually is trying to say. And that doesn't present itself. It actually takes a while to, to figure it out a lot of the time. We're coming towards the end because there's people. There are literally people queuing up outside. You can't see them. Oh, there's I at least, can't see there's at least one person. You've got so a different angle. I'm not sure how much more time we'll have, but <laughs> I wanted to ask you. You mentioned your partner earlier, Scott yep. Spark, who mm-hmm. is a songwriter and singer and works in radio. Yes, he both, does all of those things. He wears many strange audio hats. <laughs> very talented guy. Both of you uh-huh. creatives. Um, what's it like being in a partnership where both of you are creative people? Um, it's kind of fantastic because we both work within the realm of stories um so we're both we both love a good yarn but he works in radio which is a medium that terrifies me because it's it's broadcast you know it's quick and it's fast the deadlines induce cardiac arrest um and you know scott introduces a whole other world of storytelling to me i mean he was the person who introduced this american life to me back before podcasts were really popular back when you had to order this american life on cd really on amazon yeah so you would order the best of this american life and would play this american life on cd i know it sounds like like i lived in the stone age (laughs) but that's also indicative of how long that show has been going on as well um and he yeah he discovers the most fantastic things and because he works for the abc a lot of his job tends to be news focused i mean he was working on breakfast radio during like the 2007 rudd election for instance so his engagement and his knowledge of the daily news cycle which i do engage in but probably more as a like a regular news reader his knowledge of that is so in depth that i do ask him things about stories that i'm writing I'm like i'm interviewing this federal politician but what was that thing that happened i don't really understand that so he's a great explainer hmm. um and the other thing as well is in his songwriting, which is the other hat that he wears, um, he's kind of documenting our lives in a very different way mm. as well. And if you listen closely enough to his music, it's kind of in part the story of our relationship in there as well. And so I feel like very chuffed that, you know, that sort of stuff is um, is gotten down in one medium or another so it's it's really great he's really great guy yeah i just realized um you wrote about meeting him in the family law oh, yeah. and he has since uh, written in his songs about your relationship so that's kind of a kind yeah. of like mirror effect going on there. i know we're like the wainwright mcgarrigal clan just <laughs> writing about each other constantly because it's so freaking interesting <laughs> <laughs> uh your regular most regular writing is in good weekend you write a yeah, at the moment yeah column mm-hmm how did that come about? And uh, tell, tell the, the readers how you frame that column each week. <laughs> okay, so I was actually originally writing that column for Q Weekend, News Limited, Korea Mail, Queensland. Then I moved to Sydney and I was still writing that column, but I was mainly writing features for Good Weekend and columns for Q Weekend because, as I said before, I'm a slut. And then there came a point where the Family Law TV show was greenlit and... There was no way I was going to be able to continue doing feature journalism for Good Weekend. I had to write a TV show and I had to learn how to write a TV show as well. Mm. And I told my editor that at Good Weekend, I'm sorry I can't write anymore for you. And he said, well, can we steal your column? Mm. <laughs> Very devious, but well done. Mm. And so then I hauled over my column from News Limited. As a freelancer, did you ask for more money for the transfer? Uh, no, I was offered it, which is great because I'm terrible at asking for money. Oh, right. I'm very, I'm very kowtowing, typical Chinese man. <laughs> still, still, thank you. Yeah, you thank you, thank you for the rice. Um, <laughs> and and then that column started, and I was given free reign, which is sensational. Like both Q Weekend and Good Weekend gave me free reign every week. Write 350 words about whatever you want, and sometimes there were false starts and misses. And But that was fine because it was easy enough to write another 350-word piece. And it's so short. The biggest challenge was figuring out how to even fit a story into 350 words. Like, it's 
<clears throat> just slightly longer than a tweet or something. It's crazy. How do you do? You, how do you keep track of your ideas for those? Do you have like a, a big long list of things that yeah. you want to one day cover? Or I've got a stockpile. I've got a stockpile. Good Weekend's about to change its format as well, so the column will be expanded slightly, and we're reframing that. I, actually, I can give you the exclusive, Andrew. Please so. Do. We're going to change it. Um, so it's going to be 500 words and it's going to be called adult education. Um, and it's about as much as I can me learning about new things actually on the ground. Right. But in other ways, I think my column's always been about learning things. Like I might be learning something about politics or I might be learning something about my mum or I might be learning something about poo, I don't know, something. And so in some ways, it, as much as we've framed it in a new way, it kind of just gives clarity to the column that I was al- already writing. It makes me laugh every week. Oh, thanks, like it's Andrew. It's probably the most consistent laugh <laughs> of my weekly reading. It's, thanks, man. It's fantastic. I just want to know, like, how how do you uh, formulate those jokes? Are you bouncing off Scott or other people, or are you just kind of dumping on the page? Does it make you laugh when you're writing it? Or God, that's really pathetic to say, but yes, and that's <laughs> but that's how I know it's working. Yeah. Like, if you are writing something that's supposed to be sad and you're crying, then it's probably working. Or maybe you're very fragile. Or your emotions are all <laughs> Yeah, maybe you need some therapy. Um, <laughs> but the other thing as well is, yeah, I, the first thing I do is I choose the topic and I just do a huge word diary dump. Like it's like, blah. And I almost do it kind of Virginia Woolf style. Like I'm not even thinking about it. I'm just like every idea that comes into my head is going to go down. That becomes like maybe a thousand words or something like that. And then I'm like, okay, what can I fish out of here? Like what can I fish out of the spew that (laughs) is actually maybe has some legs? And I discard the rest. Like it's like a really gross stock pot that I'm boiling down. And then to get tone right, like I often look to David Sedaris, like I just I might just read a bit of his stuff to get his rhythm, like to get a sense of how you pull off a joke. I read Catelyn Moran, the British columnist for The Times as well, because I think she has such magnificent turn of phrase. I think she came up well she used a she used a quote that I think has probably been around for a while, but the way she used it was so funny, like dumber than a bag of hair. And I'm like, oh my god, that's such a good such a good turn of phrase. And she has this She has this column about chivalry and, you know, the times, why she doesn't mind chivalry. And it's like the time she's had a really heavy period and she's just like leaning up against the tube, sort of moaning under her breath, like, "Ah." and the way she pulls it off is fabulous. Or I might watch some sitcom or something just to get a tone of how a joke lands. Mm. And so, yeah, columns take me a few hours and then I, then I land it. Yep, then I file it. Have you ever been, like, the day before it's due, just completely fucking stuck and kind of asked your editor to bail you out with some kind of inspiration or nugget or anything like that? Not to sound smug, but no. Because Congrats, but that's awesome. The, 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 problem, the problem, if I have one, is <clears throat> I've got a silo of a lot of column ideas that sit there for a long time. I'm like, I'm not sure how to write that yet, but it, I'm just going to leave that there for now. So I've probably got like 50 ideas that I've not written about. Wow. And then again, Jesus. but then again, the other thing as well is, is is if you're on social media, you're cracking jokes, or you're sharing stuff about your life that's interesting. Often they're the seed of what I find might make the column. I'm pretty sure my friends have pulled me up on that. I'm just like, didn't we already see what you wrote about in your column on Facebook the other day? Uh, no, being Facebook friends with you, yeah, that's you know, absolutely right? true. You would have seen. But I've got to say, like, being friends with you on Facebook is fantastic because <laughs> you, again, are probably one of the most consistent people who makes me laugh. Like, you just, oh, thanks, the way Andrew. you phrase things and just like, I don't know. That's it, very, very You have sweet. obviously a way with words and you're very successful at that. But I probably just find things I'm not meant to find funny, funny as well. You know, I'm probably the first person to laugh inappropriately at a funeral. So you're expanding the column to 500 words. Yeah, which isn't that much of an expansion. But you t- tend to overwrite to about 1,000 generally anyway. Exactly. So I, the fact that is that I'm writing so expansively and then fishing stuff out that will work. Um, 500 feels better, actually. I find it... Usually I boil it down to 500 words and then I spend an hour trying to boil it down even further to a really sharp 350 that sometimes I feel needs some extra breathing space so it doesn't feel like too much of a gear change what kind of feedback do you get from people about that column because that's a pretty visible spot in a national publication um 
Yeah, people do stop me. Like, especially in Sydney, where I live now, um, I am that fucking annoying Asian dude that pops up at the start of the magazine. And also, I'm Asian. How often do you see us in a magazine? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, I think I've got a kind of annoyingly recognisable face that you just want to punch. Um, and... You know, I've had two people independently tell me, independently of each other, tell me that they read my column uh, on the toilet on Saturday morning. So they get their good weekend, and apparently it's the perfect length of a column for a bowel void. They <laughs> like to empty their guts while reading it, which is lovely. Yeah, um, yeah so there is an intimacy there <laughs> between me and my readers, which I really, really love. And mm. often people come up and they tell me about their experiences of whatever I've written about camping, making sourdough. God, I just sound like I've really hit my middle age. You haven't started writing about your pets yet, but that's only because you don't have any. Don't have pets. Uh, Scott, who has had pets, my boyfriend, who actually grew up with pets, actually knows what's involved in pets, which makes him not want them. I grew up with a lot of children in my life, which makes me not want them. Uh, yeah, so no. No other sentient beings in our lives that are animal-like anyway. We're just going to keep going until we get interrupted, basically. Oh, yeah, I mean, We've sure. still got like 15 minutes. Until sure. This. We'll see. Um, so what's ahead? Like you've kind of taken this random detour into, into scr- screenwriting, screenwriting yeah. which you studied at university? Yeah. Some kind of what? weird, right? Yeah, right? I did my doctorate in screenwriting. That's right. And that was more... Uh, me being slightly devious because there was the opportunity to do a PhD and I was heavily into the feature writing world by then and I thought god I don't want to do a PhD about feature writing and journalism because it might just make me hate my own profession Mm. if anything I would love to learn a slightly new skill because also the fear of what you can do as a writer is ever present how valuable your skill set is or not (laughs) is something that's always weighing down your neck like what have i committed myself to a life as a writer like oh my god you may as well just say that you want to be a penny farthing maker really (laughs) um and so i thought look i love it was when television was starting to get really great and i thought i don't i love television i've always loved television but now that television is getting really great I love television even more. I love to know how to make television. How do you do that? If I learn those skills, could that be something that I do one day? So I weirdly crafted a PhD where I would do the coursework of a master's in TV screenwriting while doing a PhD thesis um, in cultural studies and also writing a creative work, uh, an on-spec script Mm. for... uh, for a TV show and I was mentored by Jeffrey Portman and Carol Williams who were two like veteran amazing writers like Jeffrey Portman was one of the people who created Mother and Son mm. Carol Williams wrote for GP and pretty much and Police Rescue and pretty much every Australian show that was great around that time mm. they took me under their wing they became my supervisors and so it was a three pronged PhD um, then I graduated from it so it essentially felt like I did an undergrad and then I graduated from it kind of thinking, well, not, not to moralise, but thinking, well, that was a good exercise, but sadly I'll never use those skills again because... How wrong you were. Yeah, I know, twist, and a happy twist. But, <laughs> you know, like I was living in Queensland. It's not exactly like Queensland's a hub of um, screen craft, uh, except for Warner Brothers Movie World on the Gold Coast. And I was really excited about writing The Family Law and later Geyser, and I thought, well, now, I write, now I'm a dude who writes books and magazines. And then when the family law got option for, for television, that's when I thought, oh, maybe I can use those skills mm. if Tony Ayres thinks that I'm valuable enough to be in the room. And I wasn't, but <laughs> I ch- tried making myself better, and people like Tony, like Sophie, the showrunner on the show, Kirsty, the script editor on the show, they really educated me I I mean anything that you see on the screen for series one of the family law that actually worked that you thought was funny that you actually thought was heartfelt it's because they were guiding me and often coming up with the brilliant moments that you see on screen as well as Marie Cardi who wrote two of the episodes mm. no great show thanks um, Andrew uh, 
well received and so it was all sorts of records with its Facebook debut and yeah. all that sort of thing so it debuted on Facebook episode one it got over a million views or at least a million people were exposed to it virus like um, <laughs> not like viral more like like herpes mm. and um and then after it was available on SBS On Demand, it became one of the most watched shows on that platform's history, the most watched comedy in, on that platform's history as well. So we're really stoked about that. And the and book was relaunched as the kind of has the, yeah. the fake family law. I always thought, cover. oh, I should update that book. I should write another chapter at least. I just never got time. But yeah, it's the book that essentially came out in 2010 with a new cover. And it's great. Like... You know, the actors playing my family are on the cover of that book. Um, and now we're writing season two. Mm-hmm. We'll, end it, we'll leave it there. Yeah, okay. Th- thanks for talking to me, Ben. Lovely. Thanks for having me, Andrew. It's really great to talk to you. Thanks for listening to Penmanship, and thank you to my guest, Benjamin Law. You can find show notes to this episode and all previous episodes at penmanshippodcast.com. If you have feedback, I'd love to hear from you. Andrew at penmanshippodcast.com If you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to rate it on iTunes or Stitcher or whichever app you're using to listen to this podcast. You can also share it with people in your life who love great Australian writing. The theme song, as ever, is Eternally Yours by Laughing Clowns. That's it for now. Until next time. (laughs) 